So the story of the Good Samaritan is one of the most beloved and well-known stories in the whole Bible. It seems to carry such an obvious message. If someone is in need, you need to help that person. If you see someone lying in the dirt, like in that story, you have to grab him, load him onto your donkey, and set him up at the next inn. That's the right thing to do. And to walk by and let a dying man lying in the street, that is just wrong. If someone is in need, we will help. And I have never ever met a person who would disagree with that message. However, the problem with the story lies in the question that the lawyer asks of Jesus. Who is my neighbor? That he asks the question reveals the fundamental truth about the brokenness of the human race. Who is my neighbor implies that there are people around who are neighbors and others who do not qualify. And this is an important question because the assumption is that not all people are equally eligible for the benefit of neighborhood status. And this is a universal truth from the ancient Near East to the developed West, from global civilizations to the most remote tribe in the jungles of the Amazon. As my wife's uh, anthropology professor always said, all people are racist. All people divide the world into them and us. We are the chosen people, and they were not chosen. Naturally, if you're part of a chosen people, you have to treat your co-chosen people differently than you have to treat the unchosen people. And there are certain things you cannot do to people who are like you, chosen by God, but there are actually very few limits to the things that you can do to people who were not chosen by God. Basically, do to them whatever you want, or whatever you can get away with. But of course, that doesn't end here. If you divide the world into the chosen and the not chosen, you won't stop dividing the world when it comes to your own people. No, naturally, as God is already making distinctions, why should God stop all of a sudden? Surely, within the chosen group, there are people who are clearly more chosen than others are. And again, it doesn't matter where you look. From ancient mystics to modern theologians, all study their ancient texts or rely on more recent revelations, and they all find out that God has distinct favorites. Us. What a lucky coincidence. God blesses the people God likes. And these blessings, of course, manifest themselves in the form of good fortune, health, offspring, and relative wealth. People God does not like have problems with all those things. They might fall on tough times. They struggle with health. They only have daughters. Women's liberation is not a universal value. And they are poor. These are all signs that God does not favor those people. And that, of course, leads to privileges that the chosen claim over the unchosen and the most favorite chosen over the less favorite chosen. And you find that kind of thinking in almost every religious system on this planet, and it corresponds closely to the hierarchies of society. The rich and powerful of every place and age consider themselves blessed. And if you look into Western history, that goes like this. By the grace of God, I'm Count Snotnose of Bigwig, and you're just a lowly serf, so lick my boots. And the duality of we versus the others is present in first century Judaism, as it is present in all cultures of the ancient Mediterranean. The remarkable thing about first century Judaism is that in contrast to their neighbors, whose religious laws only demand that you keep your idols happy, the God of Israel demands that you have to care about and for your neighbors. So no murder, no stealing, no foreclosing of property, no taking interest and in loans to provide for the helpless and the obligation to reconcile if there is strife among neighbors. But we are fallen humans. The law in the book 
and the real existing manifestation of law in life are two different things. In this context, in which we try to answer the question, who is my neighbors? It cannot be that obvious, otherwise the lawyer wouldn't have to ask that question. And if you look into our scriptures, we read that at the time of Jesus, there's an elaborate system and hierarchy of holiness. And the young man, when he asks Jesus, is probably expecting some intricate advice to figure out if someone is holy enough to be considered a neighbor or a sinner on whom he does not have to waste his compassion. The story about the Good Samaritan that follows seems to be a real disappointment for the young man. It is a story that defies contemporary expectations with a clear message that goes against the grain of what that society considers to be good and true. It is not just the people of our group that are neighbors, but it is anyone who is in need. And that includes everyone who usually triggers the automatic response, you are not one of us. And I think here the story becomes relevant beyond the slightly naive notion that yes, we lend a helping hand to those in need. We, here today, we lived, live privileged lives. If we really want to help those who are in need around the world, we have something to lose, our privileges. Seen from a global perspective, we live in one of the wealthiest countries this earth has ever seen. We enjoy a degree of comfort and security that must seem like paradise to the wretched of this world. We enjoy economic opportunities and the blessings of democracy that are the envy of the downtrodden of this world. And that is just seeing us from a global perspective. And that does not even start to address the divisions within our own society, divisions of wrath, race, class, wealth, and so on. I'm not a naive, bleeding heart liberal who thinks we can fix the problems of the world if we only do this or if we only don't do that. Any sentence that employs the words we just have to or we only have to is completely inadequate for the task of helping those in need. The problems of this world are complicated far beyond the usual black and white of easy solutions. And the bitter conflicts of this world are also far beyond we are good and they are evil. This world is complex and multifaceted and intricate and the problems of this world are complicated, multi-layered, and multi-dimensional. There are no, there have never been, and there will never be simple solutions to any of the horrors that seem to drive this world over the edge. A crazy person who is so enraged about white police police officers shooting black people, that he shoots white police officers, that is a prime example of an easy solution that leads absolutely nowhere. And on the other hand, racism only exists in the heads of black people who just need to comply with the demands of the police and everything would be just fine is also an easy solution that leads equally nowhere. We are at a point in this country where we either turn to each other or on each other. And we need to think beyond the sound bites and slogans. There are no simple solutions. And all sides of our race conflict have to go through the heart and painful work of making peace. And for us white people, that means the confession that structural racism does exist in this country. All people are our neighbors. Black people are our neighbors. And police officers are our neighbors. And neither one of each are our enemies. God invested all people with an irrevocable human dignity and with the unalienable right to live in peace. 
And if any human dies a senseless death, the human race has failed as a whole. There is a God of love who gathers us, equips us, and sends us out into the world to do his work with our hands. We are called to embark on a mighty journey. And I do not know where that journey leads, but I know where that journey begins. It begins with the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? In Christ Jesus, there are no more slave or free, male or female, Jew or Gentile. We are all one, all children of the same parent, and we all are neighbors to all. Amen.